moment. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a task this morning that the Lord called me to do. I struggled greatly. And overnight he began to work with me. And I had given up at one point and just laid down. And he said, begin to write. And he led me to one scripture, then another scripture. Lying there, not sitting at the desk, not at a table. And when I came to the point of saying that I trust you, it's never about me anyway. He says, now then rest. And in the morning, I'll tell you what to teach. Ephesians 6, verse 12 reads, For those who can stand, please stand. It reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. This morning I want to talk about chasing symptoms while ignoring the cure. Lord God, I thank you for your word. Allow me to teach it according to your will. Pour me out that your people will learn today. Not that they will be excited. Not that they will even be necessarily happy. But that they will learn today, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Symptoms are something that we pay very close attention to. And sometimes we pay so close attention to the symptoms that we forget that there is a cure. That there is a cure. And sometimes for some, it's too late for a cure. When we look at the symptoms of, of what goes on in our life, you know, there is always something that we can do about it, but it takes a discipline inside of us. There has to be a discipline. There has to be a change. Listen to what I'm saying. Symptoms don't go away on their own. There has to be a change. There has to be something that works against the symptoms. So many times we treat symptoms and live with symptoms and abide in symptoms that we become so used to symptoms that we forget that there is a cure. I want to put it in a context that you can understand. The Lord showed me just this morning in Matthew 14 and 24, and you know the scripture, they were out in the boat. And there was a storm. The storm was the source. But the symptoms of the storm was the boat, the waves, and the wind. I said the boat because if they were not in the boat, the storm would not have caused them the amount of fear that they felt at that moment. You have to look around at what you're in at that moment. And that will help determine the level of fear that you're in in that moment. Come on, somebody. This is time for us to look around to what we're in in that moment when fear comes. Am I in the wrong place when fear tries to run up and overtake my heart? What am I in at this moment? The symptoms was a boat and some waves and some winds. But they were all just symptoms. Symptoms. And in verses 25 through 27, the cure showed up, who is Jesus, walking on the water. And nobody understood that the cure was right there in their midst because the symptoms were still there. This is where we live sometimes. 
We get so focused on the symptoms that are still there, we don't even realize that the cure can exist before the symptoms leave. Come on, somebody. Your prosperity can begin in your life while you are still struggling in poverty. Your healing takes place, glory to God, while you are still sick. We want to wait until the end before we declare, but that's not faith. We want to wait until we see it, until we grab it, until we have hold of it before we declare it. But that's not God's way. Israel turned an 11-day journey into 40 years because God says, go and take what I have given. And they said, we can't. God says, I have given. We can't. God says, I have given it. But look at them. God says, no, look at me. Look at me. We, we deal with our symptoms so much that now we've stopped looking at the cure who is God. And began focusing more and more on the symptoms. And Peter got out. Peter says, make me take the medicine. Read the scripture. It says, bid, thee to come unto, bid me to come unto thee. Tell me to come to you. I've got the prescription, but I'm not going to get it filled yet. You've got to take me to get my prescription filled. And after you take me to get my prescription filled, you got to put it in your hand and then put it in my hand. But how many of you know that I serve a God that's willing to do all of that? I, I got a Lord that is willing to do all of that. He's willing to take me to the drugstore because he is the one that wrote the prescription in the first place. Because his name is Jehovah Rapha. He doesn't practice anything. He is my healer. I said he is my healer. So he's willing to take my hand when I'm afraid. He's willing to put it in me when I don't know how to take it. Come on, somebody. The cure was in the mist. And just as Peter began to walk toward the cure, the symptoms got his attention. And when the symptoms got his attention, he began to fall back. And not only did he fall back, but he began to fall down. But he did something that we forget to do today for our cure. He didn't begin to preach. He didn't come out with a long prayer. He just said, Lord, help me. Lord, please help me. Sometimes you can cry unto the Lord with your whole heart. And no matter what you've gone through, David says, the Lord heard this poor man's cry. I don't need to become spiritual analytical to find out what I need to do. I just need to call on the name of Jesus. When I'm broken into all these pieces, I don't need to try to figure out how to put all the pieces together. I got to go back to the one that numbered every piece. And Jesus, Jesus grabbed him up. And when he got to the boat, the storm ceased. Because now he says, now the cure has taken command over the source of the trouble. This is where we get in trouble. We look at all of the little things and we're not focusing on the source of the trouble. Sometimes today, we have to go back and remember that from our earliest days in every culture, in our culture, in this America, this city, this county, there are different subcultures in everybody. If you were born in a rural area, you had another culture. If you were born in, in a city area, if you were born in a house, if you were born around apartments, if you were born whatever it is, there is a culture within a culture. And within that, within that, we began to identify certain things. See, because there are some things that those in the rural areas will find not dangerous, but those who lived in city areas will find dangerous. So we all have different ways of identifying what's dangerous, but Jesus says, that's why I want you to take me as your personal savior. See, you can't look on somebody else's paper and pass this test. 
See, because what's dangerous for you ain't necessarily dangerous for them. See, they can go up through them woods, glory to God, with nothing but a hunting knife, but you'll be out here crying for your mama. Because they have experienced something that you've not experienced at an early age. They've known how to do some things at an early age. See, they'll come and they'll see something going on in the city and they'll want to hurry up and get back to the country. But you don't even blink an eye at it because you're used to it because you've seen it at an early time. God wants us to understand that all of our systems today are looking at symptoms, our educational symptoms. Our educational system looks at the symptoms of our children instead of going for the cure. Quit telling me how a child tests out. Tell me what that child can learn. Apply yourself to those children as a whole. Don't put 30 kids in a room and tell them they're all supposed to be the same. And then we come up with these scores and says the symptoms are their background. The symptom is their culture. The symptom is how much money their parents have. The symptoms is how they, no, 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 no. Come on, somebody. We know some folks right now that came from a background that they should not have existed in. And they came up and they overcame the odds because somebody took time. Somebody took time and says there's something in you. Somebody took time and says we're going to work with what you got right now. There are people who own businesses right now that they could not pass calculus, but they can go out there and they can take a motor apart and put it all the way back together. Amen. Amen. So that calculus teacher got to go to that man to make sure his car is running. Right. <sighs> See, even in the church today, I personally have to be careful. I have to be careful. Because there's a curative power that sometimes is overlooked. Because where I get so hung up, just like everybody else, we'll point to sin. We'll point to failures. We'll point to evil. We'll point to wickedness. And we have to call it out. We have to call it out. But we cannot get so far that we overlook the pure curative powers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <sighs> Focusing on sin and sinful behavior is an easy conversation to have at a church. Because everybody in church says that while well, long as I'm up in here, I'm beyond sinful behavior. I got a couple of people that understand what I'm talking about. I used to feel like that when I came in the door of the church, whatever I did, all right, I ain't that no more. Because I'm in church right now. I'm in church right now. Now, after church, okay, that might be a problem, but I'm in church right now. But God says the curative powers that some people feel in church have to be determined to be taken with them wherever they go. Because they don't even realize that, that while they are sitting in church, they have not had an opportunity to declare the symptoms of their life or their lifestyle before the Lord so that they could receive healing. Amen. See, some people don't understand that, that there is a step that we have to go through. Because if I focus on your sin, I will not tell you about forgiveness. If I keep telling you over and over, if I beat you over the head about your sinful behavior, you will not even want to listen to me when I start talking to you about grace and forgiveness. Amen. We can't keep on focusing only on the symptoms because chasing symptoms don't win souls. Chasing symptoms is not going to win souls. Chasing symptoms is not going to snatch somebody back from hell. And sometimes we are missing out on healing. And I'm not talking about calling that thing that's wrong right. I'm not talking about giving in to what's wrong. I mean to the systems of the world. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about we have to take the light of Jesus and shine the light of Jesus on the darkness. Instead of taking our light and lighting up their sin. If I highlight your sin more than I highlight Jesus, well, the light will stay on your sin and the light of Jesus will not be something that you want to attain because everybody is looking at you and spotlighting your wrong. Mm. 
we have to understand in the church that the source of sin and evil is Satan. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The source is Satan. The source are demons. We have to quit wrestling against flesh and blood, and I know that's hard to do when flesh and blood is standing in front of you. And flesh and blood is, is, is what you see in the newspapers. But what it comes down to for today's church is, are we going to be attentive to the symptoms or are we going to be attentive to the cure? That's what it all comes down to. I can either be attentive to your crazy or attentive to the cure that God has for your crazy. I can't look at you and see that you're not a sinner. I can't look at you and see that you're not crazy no more than I can look at myself and not see my, but I can't look at me and declare what I am wrong in without looking at God and asking God, what am I right in? If I don't find what Jesus has called me to be, I'll be forever stuck in what the world has named me to be. Oh, my God. Symptoms are something that indicate a condition. Symptoms indicate a condition. Symptoms are a sign of an existence of an undesirable situation. When they ask Jesus, show us how to pray. He said, okay, and we know the scriptures. And there are two that I have always looked at that people have a problem with. The one that says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And once we progress in our lives, because we don't have a problem with saying, give us anything. Give me this day. <laughs> And forgive me, we don't have no issue with that. But the one that seems to get stuck in our throat sometime is deliver me from evil. Deliver me from the evil one. Oh, that's not me. I ain't got nothing to do with evil. You living, ain't you? Disobedience is evil. Let's just stop right there. Disobedience is evil. I have not murdered anybody. I have not robbed a bank. I have not done any of these things, but I do evil when I come against the will of God. Listen to what I'm saying. To, see, that's why it gets, it, gets, it gets hard for sometimes with Christians because we've created a whole form of gray area that if I am not walking in the symptoms of what evil is supposed to look like with me, that then evil is not a part of me. So therefore, my thought process goes to somebody else's evil. Not realizing that my disobedience to God is going to affect those that I have charge over. It's going to affect those that I be with and hang around. Because my disobedience and my willingness to be prideful, come on somebody, is going to affect somebody else's life and it's going to affect my testimony of who Jesus is in my life. Oh my God, my God says rescue me that's what deliver means it says rescue me from the evil one no matter how long I've been saved I need to be rescued Paul said I die daily I have to die to myself daily because I know that it's very easy for me to become a castaway it's very easy for me to turn and go the wrong way I have to die to my feelings and my thoughts every day not because I go and try to find evil, but evil is already in there. Something has been working on you from the time that you were a little kid. Telling you what the, the level of right and wrong is. And, and all of the rights and wrongs that we learned from childhood all the way up to adulthood didn't always line up with the word of God. You can pick through what you want to and find it out in your own background. Pick through your own family and find it out. Pick through and find it out. Come on, whatever it was, whatever the conversation was, whatever the actions were, whatever it was. Just because you grew up with it, don't make it right. 
but I don't have the symptoms of evil. No, you've ignored your symptoms because you're focusing on somebody else's. I can't bring you to the cure when I'm struggling with the cure. I'm struggling with the cure because me and the cure are bumping heads. I want to do it my way, and he keeps telling me my will be done. And I want to listen to myself, and he says, my sheep know my voice. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. And this is how we end up getting caught up in a matrix because we start being shaped by opinions, shaped by thoughts, and then our thoughts began to be shaped. Oh, my goodness. And a matrix is not something that's scientific or whatever. It's just something that has been created in something wherein something else grows out of it. And then out of that, something else grows out of it. Then something else, something else grows out of it until it's all connected and it's all interconnected, glory to God. And God says our thought patterns and our thought process, as long as we declare that, that, that we don't show any symptoms of evil, our thought progress and our thought patterns began to look at evil in a way that now we can analyze what is evil on our level and on our terms. And then when I analyze what is evil on my level and on my terms, then I declare what is good and evil. So if you don't have the symptoms that I think are wrong, I'm not even going to pray about this thing that you're doing. I'll laugh with you. If you're not exhibiting something that I feel like that's fearful, I might even try to find out how you're doing what you're doing. Oh, come on now. Come on. We live in a society that constantly chase symptoms. Every time somebody says something is wrong, we chase the symptoms. Elder prayed weeks and weeks ago. Minister prayed weeks and weeks ago. They began to point out things in prayer. And the elder, after the minister would pray, the elder would say, we're sick, Lord. They're sick, Lord. And the minister would Pray about the violence and how people, are, they're sick, Lord. They're sick, Lord. Pointing it out, calling it out, taking it before the Lord. But there's so many times we look at situations and we look at circumstances and says, well, you know what? We don't need all of that. We don't need to do all of that. We become so conditioned in our mind that sometimes even those who believe in God will say, well, that's just how it is and ain't nothing we can do about it. Well, I'm not ready to throw in the towel. Somebody had to throw dirt on my face before the towel gets thrown in. Amen. Amen. See, there's an environment out here today <laughs> that's telling us that, that these symptoms are actually freedom. That's what we're hearing. And I know we point to these things and says, well, freedom of speech, so anybody can get out here and say anything that they want to say, and, and they can hide behind their, their, their keyboard, and they can hide behind the Internet and say anything that they want to say. And, and there's a freedom where you can carry guns anytime and anywhere you want to. And now there's a freedom that they're trying to push to say that, well, now you can be anything that you want to be. If you didn't like how God made you, you can have a surgery and be something else. We, there's something out here that somebody's always looking for, a freedom, a freedom, a freedom that the devil is offering, a freedom, a freedom that the world has afforded them, a freedom, a freedom that's going to bring pain it's going to bring sin it's going to bring suffering it's going to be trauma come on come on somebody keep on looking for these freedoms right there and ignoring the cure for whatever ails them who is Jesus Christ because in Jesus Christ I can't let my mind run free on what's good and what's bad I can't let my mind run free and let my flesh do what it want to do and then I'm a holler to God I can't let my mind run free and just do anything that I, my, my, my flesh tells me and my eyes see I can't go for it like that. Amen. See, these symptoms are being pushed now. They're not being hidden. The devil is bold. The devil has gotten bold because we're not pushing back. 
We're not taking our, 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 I'll just say it like this. I don't know why the spirit gave it to me like this. We're not taking our spiritual penicillin into the nasty places. Uh, we save it in case we need it for ourselves. We save it because we don't want to offend anybody if they see us coming. We save it because we don't want to approach anybody and have them upset with us. And it would be something else if we could just leave it where it is, but we take their symptoms with us. We talk about their symptoms. We carry their symptoms. We fantasize about some of them symptoms. Come on, somebody. We fantasize about some of this crazy stuff that super rich people do. We fantasize about it. See, the super rich and the super popular and those who have all of this influence in the world can do some stuff. And we will look at that and say, wow, man, ain't that something? And the neighbor down the street do it and you call the police. This is how symptoms work. Until we identify the source 24-7 and quit trying to make the source subjective and make sure that we have a clear view that the source is the devil and the opponent is evil. We like to say sin, but come on somebody. Sin is a product of evil. Sin is a product of disobedience. Come on now. This thing started in the garden and it all began with not some treacherous act, but an act of disobedience. And then from that time on, we were all born in a spirit that was nurturing to sin. Why? Because we were given a spirit of disobedience. Oh, my God. This Ephesian scripture and, and I, God had me to purposely, I tried so hard to talk about the armor of God. And he says, mm -mm, not today. You've preached on that for quite a few times. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You're missing who you're supposed to be fighting. You're missing who you're supposed to be in battle with. And the enemy is fine with that. The enemy is fine with you turning your mind over some here with these false teachers over here. And that's leaving it at that. Cause so, so we ran them false teachers out of town. Hallelujah, we won. No, you didn't. And he wants you to look over here and look at here at all this crazy behavior. These, these immoral people over here. We chased them out of town. No. You haven't. It's not the flesh and the blood. It's the spirit that brought it in. It's a deceiving spirit. It's a hateful spirit. It's a lying spirit. It's a spirit that has no respect for the things of God. It's a spirit that teaches us that we can do what we want to when we want to. And we ain't got to listen to God. Come on now. And this is prevalent in those who said that they love Jesus. There can't nobody tell me what to do. It's a spirit. And as much as you want to slap them in the mouth sometimes, you got to get that spirit uprooted. You got to get that spirit out of there. You got to speak to that spirit, glory to God. But if you're worried about breaking a friendship, if you're worried about being a lunch friend, if you're worried about them calling you next week, if you're worried about them unliking you, then that spirit will be allowed. Because all you want to do is tell them, don't bring your, your symptoms around me so I don't get infected. That's what we do so many times. Don't, don't bring your symptoms around me. You know who I am. You know how I love the Lord. So don't bring your symptoms around me. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. No, it's not the atheist's and the agnostic, 
It's, it's not even, listen, it's not even the pedophile or the murderer. It's a source of evil. It's a source of evil. It's a source of evil that causes a man that works in law enforcement or a man that, that's supposed to be a part of the church to sit up and watch pornography, child pornography. It's a source. It's a source, and that source is a devil. The source is a devil. Yeah, they need to go to jail. They need to go wherever the law on earth will put them. But more and more, the law on earth changes depending on who's calling the shots. I was so disappointed, and this goes back 15, 20 years ago or more, when the Supreme Court says that, well, child pornography in some areas cannot be defined as child pornography if there is not a living child. They had to go back and change that. The pictures of a child that's actually moving and living, then it cannot be. They, had, they saw how stupid that was and had to declare any image that depict children in sexual ways is wrong. But we like to analyze everything. We want to make things, make sure that nobody is offended by what we think. We want to make sure that nobody feels left out by what we think. And definitely we don't want to touch on the analytical minds of those people who have influence in our society. You know, the big freaks with the big money. Because that's the judge's friend. Come on, somebody. We have to come and understand that this war is not against flesh and blood. Listen to what I'm saying to you. As a child of God in Christ Jesus, if you keep on trying to just deal with your flesh, you'll never come to the source of your problem. Can somebody tell me amen? amen. Will I lie? Will I cheat? Will I talk about people? Will I do this? Will I do that? You keep on trying to deal with your flesh. You're not dealing with the source. Lord God, there's something in me that ain't right. There's something in me, Lord God. There's something in me that, Lord God, only you can remove out of me. And we're trying to do this thing in a way that we can compromise who we are. It's almost like... I'll give, I'll give you a personal example, losing weight. You can go out here and spend thousands of dollars. You can do all of these things that you want to to lose weight. But you know what? Until my mama taught me this a long time ago. She said, son, if you don't put Jesus in it, you can go out here and do it. Every diet in the world. She says, but if you got Jesus, why don't you add Jesus in there? And Jesus told me the same thing that, that everybody else needs to understand. It comes down to you being disciplined. You can pray all you want to. You can do everything you want to. But if you don't move your body and are disciplined in what you put in your body, there is not going to be any help for you. Well, it's the same thing spiritually. If you are not disciplined enough to put some Jesus in your life, to put some word in your life from Sunday to Sunday, from Sunday to from Sunday, I feel so bad for those people who have to wait from Easter to Christmas. Lord God, I feel so bad for them people. <laughs> because something has pulled them back to say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. Christmas, I'm going. Oh, wait a minute. I, wait. Oh, no, no, no. Going for the New Year's. New Year's. I'm going to get a word for the New Year's. I'm going to get a word for the New Year's. Then I'll see you on Easter. Okay? Because there is something in their flesh telling them that that's all that they need. And they're trying, they're trying to wrestle with the world on their own terms instead of submitting themselves to God's terms. Lord, have mercy. Repeat after me. There is no flesh solution, is no flesh solution. For, my flesh for my flesh problem. There is no solution that's going to come out of my flesh for the issues that come out of my flesh. The Bible says that it is the spirit. The only thing that can contain the, the, the flesh is the spirit. Amen. Yeah. And God had me uh, last night. He showed me something here. He says, listen, we don't not only wrestle against, but we are wrestling against principalities. He says, go to the root principalities, 
principalities, theologically, is an order of angels in constant conflict with God and everything attached to God. Constant conflict. Come on, somebody. It's some influences out there that your children and grandchildren are listening to. All right, they are part of these principalities that's attacking everything that's attached to God. They are attacking everything that's attached to God. There are some things that are coming on the free airways over TV and radio. Come on, somebody, that are part of these principalities, these principalities that are attacking God and everything that are constantly attacking God and everything that is attached to God. And it's not only the principalities, their powers, principalities and powers. The power is the total sum of the evil that threaten all mankind. They just don't want to hurt your feelings. They don't want to take your money. They don't want to make you feel bad. They want you and your children to suffer and go to hell. Yeah. They want to steal the ones that you love that ain't right yet. And you want to talk about their symptoms where they still drinking and, and she's still with him. And see that, that you're talking about symptoms instead of getting them sick with the cure. I'm going to make you sick talking about this cure that loves you. I'm going to make you sick talking about how much Jesus cares about you. I'm going to make you sick. I'm going to make you I'm going to make you sick of the devil telling you how much Jesus loves you right now where you are doing what you're doing. He don't care nothing about what you're doing. But he loves you. He cares about you. This is how. This is how we can teach somebody to come to the cure. Oh, my God. In the spiritual realm. This is what influences. This is what influences. And, in, and listen, it initially influences the thought life. Come on. Think about it sometimes. I'm telling you to think right now. These random thoughts that come in your head, they're just wrong. I don't care how saved you are, out of nowhere, here comes a random thought. Here comes an ugly thought. Here comes a foolish thought. Random thoughts. Random thoughts. The devil is trying to pour a symptom over on you and to get you to react to a symptom. Listen to what I'm saying to you today. Because see, Proverbs teaches us that whatsoever a person thinks, that's what they will be. Whatsoever you allow to come and rest in your mind. Whatsoever you allow to take root in your mind. You will give up who you are and let that thing be what it is in your life. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The word of God teaches that we have become so distracted because it says when we mature, this goes back to the milk. We want milk. We want milk. Milk ain't just, oh, Jesus loves me. That's a wonderful thing. Milk ain't, but no, no, milk. How am I going to get some money? Milk is the man. How am I going to find me a woman? Milk is the woman. How am I going to find me a man? Milk is when I'm going to get me another car. Milk is when I'm going to get me a house. Somebody preach me happy. Somebody say something make me happy. No, sometimes somebody need to say something to make you cry. Sometimes somebody needs to break that thing up that's going through your mind because your mind is twisted, glory to God. Because you have such a convoluted thought when it comes to Jesus that you think that now it's all about you and not about him. And God says, no, this is not going to work. It's been about me from the beginning because in the beginning I was there. There's nothing that's been made that has not been made by me. And I came and I died for you, but not so that you could tell me what to do and manipulate me, but so that you could be free from the hand of Satan, be free from the sin, be free from your background, be free from everything and be a new creature. Amen. My God, my God. Ah. He says, those who come and get some meat, which is the word. Which is the word. He says, they will be able to discern good and evil. They won't be uh, preoccupied with trying to figure out whether it's right or wrong. See, there's too many people that have become distracted and preoccupied who say they love the Lord. We have to join together. No matter where we come from, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our background, no matter. We have to come together and, un and understand that God has already decided what is good and evil. It's called the Holy Bible. I said it's called the Holy Bible. Somebody say it is written. 
I don't have to sit up and figure it out. I don't have to debate nobody about what it is. I don't have to try to de de uh, determine whether it's a little bit good or if it's a little bit bad or none of that. It's in the word. Somebody say it's in the word. It's in the word. God has made it plain. But we're still chasing symptoms. Chasing symptoms. And the, and the one thing that the enemy loves to do, he loves to get us in an argument over the severity of the symptoms. So that we can start figuring out carnal cures. We can figure out carnal cures. How severe is it if a 30-year-old Divorces and decides that they're in love with somebody of the same sex. That wasn't severe enough for the church to speak on. So now we have it as young as eight. With simple minded foolish parents. Who let them decide if they want to be something else. And we have people in education pushing this. Oh, this is not about homophobic. It's not about hating anybody. It's about us debating and analyzing how far things should go when it's already made plain in the Bible. Well, let me get off of that right there. How is it that there was a guy that played football that had I think he had 12 kids by 10 different women. And nobody ever hit him in the head with a bat. And there's a, a guy that has a TV show and played in a couple of movies and they brag about how many kids that he has and he's not married to these women. We brag about that because guess what? Let me see. The severity of those symptoms don't seem to bother me very much. So that that guy on Wall Street that stole all the money, that don't seem to affect me much because I don't have no money invested in Wall Street. But that one that went and broke into your house and stole what you did have, you don't realize it's the same culprit. It's the same source. It's the same devil. That same devil will come through your window just like he'll go through Wall Street. That same devil works in the homosexual just like it does the heterosexual. Come on, somebody. And the sad part is, saved people steal. Somebody say amen. amen. So we know that that being a thief can't be just a symptom of the ungodly. But until we look at the source, we'll never get rid of it inside the body of Christ. What I'm saying to us is that we have to be at the forefront. We are the epicenter of change. We are the ones that will bring it about. And if we can't get ourselves together, if we can't get ourselves together, they will suffer in these symptoms and die and go to hell while we sit around and shake hands with one another and point fingers at them as they suffer. But I'm telling you right now, Jesus is not happy. He's not happy because we are the bride of Christ and we are supposed to be protecting the bride and we are letting Satan slap the bride of Christ publicly as we shut our mouths. Every time we let these People of prominence speak like they're going to speak and nobody says anything unless it's political. How about just saying something because it's wrong? Well, I don't have a platform. You got friends when they start that mess. You got people that are around you when they start that mess. They need to hear truth. Even though I said I'm not going to get into the armor of God, the armor of God, you, you want to jump to the helmet of salvation. You want to jump to the sword. You want your feet shod in the gospel. It ain't going to work if you ain't got truth wrapped around you. 
truth holds everything together. So if you can't live truth, be truth, and, and, and tell truth, nothing else is going to work. We out here with the rulers of darkness in this age. Rulers of darkness in this age. About to make us look like a Mad Max movie. America's looking more and more like those futuristic movies that I used to look at when something had happened and everything was gone and you sit and you wonder how did America end up like that? We're watching that happen. We're watching that happen. We're watching all kind of craziness go on right now. We're watching it and listen to what I'm saying to you. It's political parties on both sides that's leading us down this path. I said political parties on both sides. Both sides leading us down this path. When Jesus was talking about that narrow path and that broad path, he wasn't talking about it was so hard to do. He was saying because there are so many distractions and so many other ways that people want to go that other way. People want to go that other way. He said, I didn't make it hard for nobody to come. I brought the law all the way down to two things. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. I broke it all down. I broke it all the way down. The hundred, what is it, the hundred and sixty, some hundred and thirty, whatever it is in the law. He said, I eliminated all of that. Love God, love your neighbor, but you can't even do that. Because you have to analyze who my neighbor is. And you got to analyze when it's convenient to love God and who can I love God around. And I can love God when I'm with him and when I'm with her. But over there, those people don't go to church, so I can't love God around them. And you wonder how sometimes these people's lives aren't changing because you're hiding your life. Chasing symptoms. Mm. Rulers of darkness have allowed us to draw a line. And the crazy thing is, we've drawn the line. But we've tried to find night vision goggles. We want to see in the darkness instead of bringing light to dispel the darkness. And the church sometimes wants to understand the darkness instead of cursing the darkness. What are we going to do? When are we going to do something? Because every day there's a war for souls. Every minute of every day, there is a war for souls. No, spiritual warfare don't start when you get your bottle of oil. Spiritual warfare don't start when your feelings get hurt. Spiritual warfare don't start when your child starts acting like a devil. Spiritual warfare, no, every minute of every day, there is a battle for souls. And if you are in the army of the Lord, it's time to step up. It's time to step up. I cannot go AWOL at certain times of the year. I cannot go AWOL when I'm around certain people. So many people don't understand. Well, what happened to my life? You adjusted your vision to darkness. And when you came into the light of God, you couldn't see. So what you would do was you would go back to the place where you had adjusted your vision where you could see. Well, oh, I'm talking to somebody. I hope, I hope somebody hears this and it hits them in their heart. Because Jesus is waiting for you. His love never stopped. You just stopped receiving it on his terms. Because you wanted it on your terms. Because every time we look at violence and hate and racism and, 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 and child pornography and all of these other things, we're looking at symptoms. We are talking about symptoms. But nobody on the news is going to say, this is the devil. This is the devil. Psychologists will tell you that anger comes from fear. But nobody wants to talk about that. Because they just want to say he crazy, she mean. 
We don't understand sometimes that the prideful person sometimes is the most broken person in the room. We're going to have to get this thing to the place where we're trusting God. We're trusting God because God says, you're going to have to do the fighting. You're going to have to do the fighting. I'm not sending angels. You have more than Jesus had. You have more than the first century church had. But you've gotten so caught up in being distracted. And the enemy has gone so far in using who we are to make us feel good about ourselves. That he actually has dictated what the church looks like if it's successful. And we drank that Kool-Aid. It's about souls being changed and saved and won for Jesus. And if they're not done on Sunday, we got Monday through Saturday to get it done. We wonder where they're at on Sunday, where we're at on Monday through Saturday. What have we done Monday through Saturday to make somebody interested and I know some of you live that life. I know some of you offer. I know some of you get so sick and tired of asking and offering and asking and offering. And God says, no, don't worry about it. I'm going to honor what you do. Listen to what I'm saying. He says, I am going to honor what you do. The people that you try to reach, the people that you do invite, their blood will not be on your hand. Their life will not be on your conscience. He says, because you have done what I have asked you to do. Amen. 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 But Paul summed it up. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we got to quit fighting according to the flesh. <laughs> I'm more than what you see. Come on, you need to look at yourself. You need to look at yourself. You need to declare over your own life, I'm more than what I see. Come on, come on, come on. Declare that in your own life. I'm more than what I see in myself. I am who God says I am. You have to declare that over your life. Because... One of the tools of the enemy is intimidation. You can't do that. You're not saved enough. I remember, the, come on, you just did this and you just said that. No, you can't do that. No, I am who God says I am. I am delivered because God says I'm delivered. You looking at my symptoms and I'm walking in my cure. Come on, somebody. You looking in my symptoms and I'm walking in my cure. You're looking in my past and I'm ready for my future. Glory to God. You're dealing with what I used to be and I'm getting ready for who I'm going to be. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. He said the weapons of our warfare. The weapons of our warfare. Our warfare. You got to be ready to go to war. I said, you got to be ready to go to war, not with flesh and blood. I said, not flesh and blood, but you got to be ready to go to war with those evil, wicked, dark things. Those things that are trying to set up a stronghold. He said, you got to be ready to go to war. You can't wait for it to come to your door. You can't wait for it to happen to your family. You can't wait for it to be a friend of yours. You can't wait for the phone call. You got to be ready for warfare when you get up. You got to be ready for warfare when you leave the house. Yeah. You got to be ready for warfare when you go to the grocery store. Yeah. You got to be ready for warfare when you go to your job. Yeah. You got to be ready for warfare when you're sitting at a stoplight. Yeah. You got to be ready for warfare even today when you're sitting inside the church. You got to be ready for warfare at all times. Amen. 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 He says, and it's not carnal. It's not of your flesh. It's not of your flesh. 
So sitting there telling somebody to go to hell is not going to get rid of that demon. Sitting there and pointing out everything that's wrong with them is not going to help them overcome the thing that they're in right now. The obvious, the obvious is easy. <sighs> he says, this, these weapons are mighty, but they're only mighty in God. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Prayer and faith. These weapons that he's already given us. These weapons that he's already given us, they're useless unless you are in him. They're useless unless you're in him. It's almost like trying to take South American money to an American bank. No, you got to go and get some change, baby. God says, no, we got to go and do some change in here. There has to be some change in that takes place before you see the profitability of what I have given you. Because you're trying to bring me from what was there. And you're trying to bring it to here. He says, and that's not going to work. He says, it has to be in me. And it's not for what you want it to be. It's to pull down strongholds. It's to pull down. Listen, a stronghold is a place where the enemy has set up shop. In ancient days, strongholds were a place where they would set up and look down over their enemy. And the enemy knew that they would have a hard time getting to them. They would have a hard time getting to them. Come on, somebody. We talk about the walls of Jericho, but Jericho was built on a hill. Uh, come on, somebody. We talk about the walls falling down, but Jericho was built on a hill. You had to go uphill. You had to go uphill. And God says, that's all right, you ain't got to worry about it because when the walls come down, I'm going to make the walls your steps so you can just go on and walk into the city and take it, amen? amen. See, he says, this thing, this thing that's going to happen in your life, you have to be in front of it. You have to pull down, pull down. You can't worry about whose feelings are hurt. You, you cannot worry about who's not going to like you because it's the generation that's coming behind you that's going to reap the benefits. Yeah. It's the people, glory to God, that, that are looking at you that's going to reap the benefits. It's the people that know that you trust Jesus uh, that are going to reap the benefits. Yeah. It's not for your personal benefits. Sometimes it's fine to do it for your personal benefits or for your family's benefits, but sometimes you just got to do it because it's wrong and the word of God says it's wrong. Pull down strongholds. Y'all need to quit talking about people like that. Y'all need to quit talking about people like that. Don't come over here, man, talking about you, done, you got something. You ain't got nothing for me if it ain't no, no nothing that ain't come out of a store. Pull down strongholds. It's not those convenient strongholds. It's those everyday strongholds. Oh, it's not, it's not a, a, a legion of demons always, always surrounding it. No, it's that lying spirit. It's that stealing spirit. It's that whoring spirit. Come on, somebody. It's that cheating spirit. It's that greedy spirit. It's that prideful spirit. You need to step back sometime and say, man, ain't you too full of yourself today? You are really full of yourself. Lord, have mercy. God I can't even love you because you love you too much for God to get in. God can't even get in there to love you. Lord, have mercy. And casting down arguments. Casting down the thoughts and plans. Casting down. Casting down. Not trying to analyze, not trying to make a deal with. But casting down, getting it where it needs to be, beneath your feet. Jesus was resurrected so his people would have Satan and sin beneath their feet. Not eye to eye, but beneath their feet. This is why he was resurrected for us. This is the benefit of salvation. That he has no hold over us. Unless we give him hold over us. Every high thing that exalts itself 
against the knowledge of God and not worry about it. Every high thing, and I'm going to use this, and I know some, some people are going to say, well, why are you saying that? Because Biden and Trump are interchangeable for the people that they're trying to please. Biden and Trump are interchangeable for the people that they're trying to please. Neither of them had God first. Go back to the black man. It was him that turned the White House into the rainbow colors of the LGBTQ community. And I spoke out about it, and all of a sudden you thought I had joined the Klan. Because it was wrong. See, we can't look at certain things and say, well, that's all right. Come on, those who are old enough, oh yeah, O.J. Anderson, shut up. Oh, they're trying to frame Michael Jackson. You ain't got no business in bed with somebody else's little cherry. Come on now. Oh, oh man, what are you talking about, Pastor? That was innocent. That ain't innocent. That is not innocent, that's wrong. You see how our minds work? You see how our minds work when it comes to certain people? That those high places are untouchable? I remember when people were laughing about some of the stuff that Rick James did. Because they listened to his music. And there are some people before they put him in jail were still going to R. Kelly and saying, we don't care what he did. Untouchable because they're in a place that we have made high in our hearts. Listen to what I'm saying. When you start making these people high in your heart, high in your mind, you'll declare certain evil that they do to be off limits. That's what that scripture is saying. Don't leave it right there at the president and the entertainers. How about your friends? Come on. I lost friends years ago, years and years ago, many, many years ago. Some of them because you ain't going to hit that girl in front of me. Well, you can get out of my house. That's what I'm going to do. But you ain't going to hit that girl in front of me. Because I wasn't in fellowship with God, but I knew that was evil. No, it wasn't wrong. It was evil. See, we like to design. It's not wrong. It's evil. That's evil. And this is how we like to name things. And I didn't mean to, to say anything harsh to you, but if we say it's wrong, we'll leave room for it. But when we declare it as evil, we know it's got to go. Are y'all understanding me? Let me get ready to go on to the house today. I, I hope you have understood what I've tried to teach you today. Because he says every thought, every thought, Every thought has to come into the captivity and the obedience of Christ. But he says this. He says, being ready to punish all disobedience. Being ready to punish all disobedience. When your obedience, when your obedience is full. Yeah. I can't talk to you about what you're doing when I'm doing something else. And I'm not obedient. But I'm going to bring up your obedience, disobedience. Because our lives are based on our thoughts. Our lives are based on what we think and how we rationalize life. And God says, I got the cure right here. You don't have to question what it is. Oh, this is an in the face when, when the Lord first gave me this title weeks and weeks and weeks ago, I didn't know what was going to come of it. And this is an in the face for every Christian out there. If you declare yourself to be a Christian, let's get with it. Let's get with it. Let's, let's come on, let's get with it. You know, that gray area, that, that, that whole gray area, that's the devil's area. 
God says light. I am light. I said let there be light. Jesus is the light of the world. You know gray. There's no gray. You're mixing the dark with the light. You're mixing the dark with the light. You're putting a shade over the light because the light's too bright for what you're doing because your symptoms are being seen. And if we can come away and understand that God is patient because he is love. God is kind. God is not sitting up and writing down everything that you've done that's wrong. And just like Peter began to focus on the symptoms of the storm, Jesus is saying, holler at me. Holler at me. Don't try to sound like somebody else praying. Just say, Lord, help me. He said, because I'm the cure for your sickness. I'm the cure for your bad dreams. I'm the cure for your poverty. I'm the cure for your generational curse in your family. I am the cure of these thinking thoughts that keep coming back against you. I am the cure for everything that comes against your mind. I am the cure. He says, but you need to holler at me. Because you're sinking. Sinking with Jesus standing right there. Saved and sinking. So you won't even have a chance to help somebody that's unsaved be saved. Pastor, if you will, come and close us today.